Hey everybody, it's Drew from 108 Methods. Um, wanted to do a quick uh, video to go with our very long blog post today about uh, Manchin and what he's calling the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, basically the Manchin-Schumer Compromise Bill in place of Build Back Better, uh, which is being talked about a lot right now. Um, so we'll get right into it. We've just got a couple slides to talk you through. First of all, uh, you may have heard a bunch about this. You may have heard that it's a genius bipartisan deal. You may have heard that it's trash and it should be killed with fire. Uh, you may have heard a lot of things. There's been a lot of headlines. It is, if nothing else, a big breakthrough in negotiations about uh, climate change and budget reconciliation, um, what used to be called Build Back Better, um, and uh, which we spent a lot of time talking about last year. So uh, we'll get right into what it is and what it isn't. Uh, first of all, what it is, is it's pretty simple. This is the successor to Build Back Better, which is to say it's a budget reconciliation package um, that deals with, amongst other things, climate change and clean energy. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff in there, prescription drug pricing, raising taxes on corporations, some other good stuff. Um, but if you are a climate movement activist, which most of, most of us are, uh, you may have heard that it's a game-changing plan, and you'll hear these two numbers a bunch of times. One is 369 or $370 billion of spending on climate change and clean energy. That's about correct. And the other one you hear a lot is 40% uh, that it's going to cut global warming pollution 40% uh, by 2030. Um, and we'll dig into both of those claims in just a moment. Um, it is a little bit complicated because it's a budget bill. It deals basically with spending and with taxes. Uh, as a budget reconciliation package, in fact, it has to deal with spending and taxes. And that's a good thing in one small part because it means that Joe Manchin couldn't force into the conversation some reforms to permitting and pipelines and some other stuff that is not tax and spending related, uh, which he wanted included in the bill. That'll have to be taken up separately in a, an additional bill later on in the fall. Um, but this bill is uh, all about the money, um, and it has to be about raising revenue, which is called taxes, and spending revenue, which is called spending, uh, and it has to be about the congressional budget, because that's what a budget reconciliation bill is allowed to do. And if you remember way back in 2021, a whole year ago, we spent a lot of time talking about this and what did and didn't qualify, and we're still in the process of figuring out if there's anything in this bill that doesn't qualify for budget reconciliation. So there's a lot we don't totally know about how much it will cost and what the impacts of the spending will be on the economy, but we do have a lot of the top line numbers, and we'll put a link in the notes uh, here. Uh, to this great breakdown by Ben Beachy from the Blue Green Alliance, which uh, goes sector by sector and walks you through the how much money the Inflation Reduction Act, the Manchin Schumer bill spends, versus things like the previous Thrive Agenda that we were supporting, or Build Back Better, the original $550 billion package that was proposed by President Biden. Um, there are a couple of reasons why we were skeptical about some of the early claims. When the deal was announced on Wednesday night, right away, two things didn't sound quite right. The first thing it has to do with this number, 50% by 2030. That's what President Biden promised at the uh, kind of middle part of his first year in office. He made a big speech at the White House where he said, we're rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, and he specifically committed to cutting U.S. emissions of global warming pollution 50% by 2030. What people say is in the Manchin-Schumer bill is 40% by 2030. So just on the face, that would sound pretty good, right? You're basically getting 40% instead of 50%, but still by 2030, that's basically four-fifths of what we want. Um, and it's spending, again, something like $390 billion as opposed to $550 billion uh, on climate and clean energy, uh, which was what was in the original Build Back Better plan. So it sounds pretty good just kind of on the, the press release. But when you dig into the numbers, it's not as good as it sounds. The first thing we got suspicious about was that 40% claim. People were out tweeting the night that the bill came out and Joe Manchin in his press release announcing the deal with Chuck Schumer said it would cut global warming pollution 40% by 2030. But here's the first problem. When the Build Back Better Act was under consideration in 2021, the original bill, which again invested $550 billion in climate and energy, one of the biggest parts of it, and probably the biggest part of it in terms of climate change emissions, was this thing called the Clean Energy, Clean Electricity Payment Program. Basically, it was a plan to pay utilities, electric utilities, money to build renewable energy and to fine them or penalize them if they didn't build renewable energy and instead relied on fossil fuels. 
It was a huge portion of what was going to raise money and also spend money on climate change in the Build Back Better plan, and it is not in the Manchin-Schumer compromise. So my first question was, if the Build Back Better plan did 45% reduction by 2030, and a big chunk of that was from this clean energy payment program, and the new bill, the Manchin-Schumer bill, doesn't have the clean electricity payment program in it at all, but it's still going to get us to 40% by 2030. How is that working out? Because it seems like we should be not getting as far for as much money. And the short answer is, there's a good reason why we were suspicious, and it's because it probably won't get us there. This is a graph that just came out in the last uh, 72 hours or so from a group called the Rhodium Group, which is, generally speaking, a very moderate think tank on climate change things. They're funded in part by the fossil fuel industry, and they tend to be pretty optimistic about the ways that investing in things like renewable energy tax credits or carbon capture technologies can bring down global warming emissions. So these are the most friendly reviewers you can have for your climate and clean energy plan. And if you look, the, the blue part of this graph um, is what will happen if we do nothing other than what's already happening. This kind of current policy, what the Biden administration is already doing uh, to date. And you can see that it's projected to achieve a 24 to 35% reduction in global warming pollution, again, by 2030. That's pretty good. And as we've been saying for months and months, the Biden administration is doing some good things. It's just not doing enough to get to that 50% by 2030 target that they have announced and which is required under our commitment to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. The orange bar in this is what will happen if we pass the Manchin-Schumer Compromise. And so the first thing you want to note is that the bottom of that orange bar does get down to 40%, but that is the most optimistic estimate of what could happen from the most optimistic group of reviewers at the Rhodium Group. So the absolute best case every single thing breaks in our favor is that it might reduce global warming pollution 40% by 2030. But if you look at the top bar of this chart, it says that you could end up with only a 31% reduction in global warming pollution by 2030 if you enact the Manchin-Schumer Compromise. And that's actually less pollution than you could get by doing nothing at all with the, just the current policies that are in place. So it's really important to understand this is a big gamble. What the uh, Manchin-Schumer Compromise represents fundamentally is a bet. The folks in uh, politics, the Democrats in the House and the Senate who are cheering this bill on right now are betting, and it is a big risky gamble, that we will end up at the bottom part of this chart, not at the top part of this chart. And nobody knows the answer where we're going to be in 2030. There is no way to perfectly accurately predict what will happen if we inject all this money into the economy and just see what happens. And so the good news is there's a lot of good stuff in the bill. $379 billion is a lot of money. And it is, in fact, about four-fifths as much money as the Build Back Better bill was going to uh, invest in the clean energy economy. But it is not necessarily going to get us all the way to 40%. And it is definitely not going to get us to 50% by 2030, which is what Joe Manchin had promised. More action is going to be required. On top of this stuff, there's a real problem uh, with the math on this, which again, fundamentally, what we've always been talking about is how fast can we cut pollution, emissions of global warming pollution from the US economy. That bottom green line is what we want to be doing. And that's what gets us to 50% by 2030 and then net zero by 2050. If I kind of move my head over here, you can see it gets all the way down to zero at the very end of the chart, right? The upper green line right up here is what was gonna happen if we passed the Build Back Better Act as it was written last year. That obviously isn't gonna happen. So the Manchin-Schumer compromise is probably somewhere a little bit above that green line, right? Uh, it's between those two things. And then the blue line, scenario one, was originally uh, what could be done with Biden and executive action last year. Now, a whole year has elapsed and Biden hasn't done a bunch of the stuff that would have been necessary. Things to get to that blue line chart that would have been necessary in the past year would have been like banning oil and gas leases in the Gulf of Mexico last year. President Biden's had the power to do that since he took office. He has not done it since he took office, despite promising to do so. And so that's why the blue line curve is not the same as what has actually happened. Uh, but it could have been if Biden had taken more aggressive action and if Biden had taken all of the actions he can as the president of the United States, he could get down to about the 50% level 
but probably not by 2030. It would probably take him a good 20, 30 years to get all the way down to 50% reduction in emission just using administrative action. So we've always said we need both halves to work together, right? We need Biden to take aggressive executive action, like declaring a climate emergency and ending fossil fuel drilling on public lands and waters. And we need Congress to act by passing something like the Build Back Better Act or some other kind of big investment in climate and clean energy. The good news is this bill has a lot of the investments in climate and clean energy that we needed. Big incentives for electric cars, big incentives for renewable energy development, big incentives for uh, more heat pumps and more Defense Act Production Act spending. So it's got a lot of the stuff in there that we wanted to be in there. But there's another problem in addition to just the scope of ambition that we get to in the next one. The next problem is that um, the climate uh, provisions in there, the renewable energy investments, are specifically tied to investing in fossil fuel development. Uh, the Gene Su uh, tweet here on the right um, is the most important one, which is there's a, a specific one-to-one -one trade off. You cannot build wind power unless you have licensed offshore drilling. You cannot build solar power on public lands unless you have also already permitted fracking and drilling on public lands. And that pairing of incentives is really a problem. One problem is that it just, by definition, it creates sacrifice zones. It says we are going to trade the lives of people who live in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Permian region west of Texas, in the Alaskan Arctic. We're going to trade their lives and their livelihoods for clean energy in other places. And it makes that not only just explicit, but it makes it the law of the United States of America. You can't have a wind turbine in Massachusetts until you fracked somebody's backyard in Pennsylvania. You can't have a solar power plant in California until you frack the Permian Basin in Oklahoma. Somebody's home has to get destroyed for someone else to have nice, clean, renewable energy. And that's a terrible precedent to write into law. American energy policy is already pretty racist and biased as it is, to actually codify the whole thing and make it a one-to-one -one exchange is incredibly dangerous as a matter of policy. The other reason this is really bad and dangerous is that, as I've been saying, it's all essentially a big gamble. Amy Westervelt put this succinctly by saying, we should remember, it's not like the fossil fuel industry is bad at gaming a market system. They've basically been doing that for hundreds of years so far. And they've been doing it really effectively. The fossil fuel industry makes millions of dollars. They're making record profits right now on a market system where solar energy and wind energy are cheaper than fossil fuels. And so they already know how to do this. If you set up a system where you're specifically saying, I'm going to give billions of dollars to renewable energy, and I'm going to give billions of dollars to fossil fuel energy, odds are the fossil fuel guys are going to figure out how to get their money, and they're going to figure out how to stay in business. And since the whole game with climate action is we have to not just be building renewable energy, you have to be building renewable energy and using it to replace fossil fuel energy. That's how emissions come down, as opposed to what happened during the Obama administration when we had a similar all of the above energy strategy. Emissions kept going up. Renewable energy kept going up too, but not as fast as fossil fuel energy. And that's because we poured billions of dollars into both fossil fuels and renewable energy, but fossil fuels are just better at gaming market economics. And because of that, they ended up building more fossil fuel plants, more fracking plants, more gas export terminals, more oil export terminals, got built under Barack Obama, then commensurate wind and solar energy. And that was basically the story of the Barack Obama, uh, all of the above energy strategy, is that even though they kept saying any day now, emissions are going to peak and then decline because we're going to have built so much renewable energy is going to get super cheap and the fossil fuels will all go away. It never actually happened. We just kept building more and more and more fossil fuel energy and drilling more and more and more wells. And when they couldn't sell the uh, energy domestically, the fossil fuels domestically, they shipped them abroad. They sell coal to oil abroad now. We sell gas abroad now. We sell all kinds of fossil fuels abroad now. And there's a huge international market for those fossil fuels. Um, and second thing, uh, you know, just to underscore, this is really, it's not a small trade. Uh, one of our, our favorite leading climate spokespeople, uh, Leah Stokes, was out saying the night the bill was released that there would be 10 good things in the bill for every one bad thing. But the problem with that is not all good and bad things are the same size. If I change 10 light bulbs in my house from uh, incandescent light bulbs to compact fluorescent light bulbs, I've done 10 good things. If I then turn around and build one 4,000 megawatt coal-fired power plant, I've only done one bad thing, 
But that one bad thing was a heck of a lot bigger than my 10 good things. And that's basically what's in the bill right now. It calls for leasing 260 million acres of public lands and waters to the fossil fuel industry. That's an area six times bigger than the Gulf of Mexico. On this map, the Gulf of Mexico area, that's the Gulf of Mexico, outer culture natural shelf. Every single acre of it has to be leased under the mansion schumer compromise. And then we need six more chunks of land that big to sell off to the fossil fuel industry. The bill doesn't necessarily say that they have to sink a well in every acre that is leased, and it doesn't say how much or whether oil and gas have to be produced from them or burned, but that's a lot of land to sell to the fossil fuel industry. And the idea that they're gonna buy all that land and frack all that land and drill all those wells and never have any of that carbon get burned is pretty ridiculous. And so really what this is doing is it's saying, it's a bet, it's a gamble. The folks in Congress who are backing this bill are saying, we bet if we pour as much money as we possibly can into both the renewable energy industry and the fossil fuel industry, that the fossil fuel industry will get there faster and that people will choose to power their homes and their cars and their electricity with renewable energy, not fossil fuel industry, over the next 10 years that will just outcompete them. But it's literally never happened in America. So it is a big, big risky gamble. Um, and along the way, we're doing all this violence to these communities. We're specifically saying, Gulf of Mexico, sorry if you live there, your land is now a sacrifice zone. If you live in the Permian, your land is now a sacrifice zone. If your people have been there for hundreds or thousands of years because you're an indigenous community that's native to that land, still too bad. Your area is a sacrifice zone and somewhere else is going to get renewable energy development and that's going to be great for them. But these places are still going to be completely left behind and completely destroyed by extraction because it's not a small amount of land we're talking about turning over to the fossil fuel industry and the impacts of fossil fuel extraction are not minor. Uh, we're talking about fracking wells, we're talking about air pollution, we're talking about carcinogens in the air, and then we're talking about all the climate impacts on top of that from burning all those fossil fuels. So this is a huge impact over a very long period of time that we're sacrificing some communities to in exchange for the hopes that the next generation will get the payoff and that they'll have renewable energy to power their economy. And then there's this last bit, which is really just the worst. Uh, which is in addition to all the stuff that's in the mansion schumer compromise that we've just talked about that's bad for climate change, they also made a separate deal essentially with uh, Joe Manchin to pass what he calls a permitting reform bill, but which is really a permit every pipeline bill. Joe Manchin's been incredibly clear, especially in the way he talks about the Mountain Valley Pipeline, that he does not believe any agency, not FERC, not Department of Energy, not Army Corps of Engineers, not Department of Interior, nobody should ever under any circumstances say no to a fossil fuel pipeline, export facility, compressor station, export terminal, none of it, if the hydrocarbons that are going into that are from America. Joe Manchin's basic belief, and it's not a new idea, it came from the Trump administration and uh, Secretary Perry, when he was Trump's energy secretary, called this molecules of freedom. I call it patriotic hydrocarbons. It's the idea that if the oil and gas and coal originate in the United States of America, they are by definition good, virtuous, and deserving of the support of the American government. So if the oil or the coal or the gas comes from America, American permitting agencies like FERC and EPA and Army Corps and DOI and whoever else should never under any circumstances say no. And Joe Manchin has been incredibly explicit about this in the way that he talks about the Mountain Valley Pipeline. The Mountain Valley Pipeline is a frack gas pipeline. It is billions of dollars over budget. It is years behind schedule. It has been sued and lost in court repeatedly over its ability, uh, inability I should say, to meet basic environmental standards. And yet Joe Manchin says, absolutely, it should always, always, always get more permits to proceed because it's an American energy source. And that's all that really matters to Joe Manchin and to folks who think like him. If it's American energy, if the, the fracking uh, pad or the oil well or the coal mine was in America, then whatever comes out of it should always be given uh, carte blanche permission to get to market and to hell with anybody who gets in the way with the environmental impacts, with the public health impacts, with the climate impacts. None of that matters to Joe Manchin and his team. The only thing that matters is whether the energy came from America, and if so, it is good, and it should always go through. Manchin's permitting reform bill writes that into law. It basically says, 
that all these agencies that are supposed to look at the environment and public health and what's called the public interest impact. So basically they're supposed to weigh, okay, we get you know, fracked gas or we get oil or we get carbon out of this pipeline or this project, but is it in the best interest of Americans overall? Uh, and that involves looking at what's the impact on endangered species? What's the impact on local communities? Are they gonna you know, put a bunch of sediment in the stream near your house and kill an endangered candy darter while they're building the pipeline? All those kind of things, they're supposed to be balancing the cost and benefit of these kind of decisions. Manchin's uh, argument is no more cost and benefit. Everything is just benefit. If it's American energy, it is good, permanent, stop asking questions. That's what he wants to write into law. And it would be a huge problem if he did. Two big reasons why. We mentioned the sacrifice zones that we're going to declare some places to be not deserving of being saved uh, in our country. The other big problem is it's going to basically kill every environmental lawsuit we have. And if you look back at the last 10 or so years, the only place we've really been winning on climate change is in the courts. We've stopped and delayed a bunch of big pipeline and fossil fuel projects over the last few years by suing them in courts and forcing these kind of environmental rules. If Joe Manchin is able to pass this law and say to hell with your environmental rules, build the project, it's going to be really hard to bring those lawsuits, and it's going to be incredibly unlikely to win those lawsuits. And that means we're going to be at a huge disadvantage when we fight projects like the Mountain Valley Pipeline, like DAPL, like Line 3, like drilling offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. Those are all projects that have been delayed or derailed at times by lawsuits in the last 10 years. And if we lose that ability, it's going to be a huge handicap for the climate movement. So what are we going to do about all this? There's a lot of bad news, a little bit of good news, and a lot of, uh, I don't know, about all this stuff. So here's the basic gist. First thing is, uh, we absolutely have to keep fighting. Uh, this is going to be three things at once, and it got all kind of meshed up, but you get the idea. Uh, we want to keep the pressure on all the stuff you've been doing over the last couple of months. Every petition you've signed, every action you've gone to, every dollar you've donated has all brought us to this point. So we don't want to stop putting pressure on. So absolutely, if you haven't already, sign up to be part of Now and Never, uh, which has shifted its demands from uh, shutting down the congressional baseball game unless they pass a climate bill to shutting down various congressional actions until they pass the climate bill. Uh, you can also sign your petition to Chuck Schumer to remove Joe Manchin as chair of the Energy Committee. That's still a good idea because it will reduce his bargaining power in the negotiations going forward. You've heard me say a bunch of times in this uh, recording that Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer negotiated a deal. All the bad stuff is coming from Joe Manchin. All the good stuff is coming from Chuck Schumer and the Democratic caucus. So if we can reduce uh, Joe Manchin's bargaining power going forward, that is going to be good for the planet and the climate and all of us. Um, and uh, we're today, we just delivered uh, over 4,000 comments from you. Thank you if you were one of the folks who sent them in uh, to FERC opposing the Mountain Valley Pipeline. We'll have lots more actions like that in the coming weeks and months, and we encourage you to take part in them. Second thing, uh, we do need to pass some kind of climate bill, but it doesn't have to be Joe Manchin's climate bill. The good thing about the legislative process is it's full of opportunities to amend things, to change things, to conference on things. That's basically what the legislative process is designed to do. Um, and so we have a great opportunity over the next couple of weeks. They want to move this bill quickly, the Manchin-Schumer Compromise Bill, um, but not so quickly that there's no time to offer amendments, or questions, or consideration. And one of our best opportunities will come when the bill passes the Senate, which will probably be pretty much line by line as Schumer and Manchin negotiated it. But when it goes over to the House, there's a good chance for House members to offer amendments, to offer changes to the bill. And anything that's different between the House version and the Senate version has to go to what's called a conference committee, where then they have to work out the differences between the two bills. We don't want to take too long with that because passing the $369 billion investment in climate and clean energy is important, and we don't have forever to get it done. But we definitely have a couple of weeks to haggle, haggle over the details. And if we can do anything in there to reduce the number of acres that are offered in exchange for wind and solar power, for example, that would be a really easy amendment for someone to offer, to negotiate over, and to arrive at a more reasonable compromise. Um, the other thing we really need to do uh, is to kill Manchin's uh, permit all the pipelines bill, that second bill we were talking about, uh, which is really bad. Uh, and would basically require agencies to permit fossil fuel infrastructure, including pipelines like the Mountain Valley Pipeline, but it has to be offered as a separate bill. If you remember back last year, 
Manchin did this exact dirty deal to Democrats. He said if they voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which he supported, that he would vote for Build Back Better. And then, of course, he said, yoink, and did not vote for the Build Back Better bill. And now here we are almost a year later voting on a much smaller version of Build Back Better, though eventually getting a vote on it. There's no reason why uh, House Democrats in particular in the House Progressive Caucus in the U.S. Congress shouldn't do the exact same thing to Joe Manchin that he did to them and say, great, we'll vote for your bill, which uh, you support the uh, infrastructure in, uh, what is it, uh, Reduction Act uh, and uh, Build Back Better Light. Uh, we'll pass that bill. And then, sure, we'll see about your pipeline permitting bill after you vote for our thing first. Um, so they should absolutely return the favor and we should absolutely keep the pressure on. One of the nice things is uh, for us in the climate movement, uh, Manchin's bill, the pipeline permitting bill, will need 60 votes in the Senate. It has to pass a filibuster, and it will also need Republican votes in the House to pass. Um, so there's an ample opportunity to kill that bill, to gum it up, to water it down, to make it not be as bad as it is, and to do all the stuff that Manchin has done over the last year to all kinds of bills that we care about, from voting rights to women's rights to climate justice to everything else. Uh, he slowed the process down time after time after time, time to repay the favor uh, with his bill and not pass it fast, not make it easy for him, but actually have a long, drawn-out, protracted negotiation over the bill. And the last thing uh, I'll say that we need to do uh, is we're going to have to fight every fossil fuel project everywhere it is. Um, you've heard these kind of things from us before. We've talked about this a lot over the years. And part of what in, uh, 198 Methods exists to do is to connect direct action and digital protest together. Um, but if something like the Manchin-Schumer compromise passes, probably what's going to happen is that we're going to codify into law the idea of some of these communities as sacrifice zones, especially the Gulf, especially the Permian, and especially Alaskan communities, uh, as well as some parts of Appalachia and Pennsylvania. Uh, and you're also going to see a tougher time fighting in the courts and fighting in the legislature, uh, in Congress in particular, over climate policy. Um, those are just the facts. If this bill passes, it's going to get harder to sue the bastards, and it's going to get harder to legislate the bastards, which means direct action is going to be the way that we stop these things. On the other hand, because the bill itself is a big gamble, that renewable energy will get to the marketplace faster and bigger than fossil fuel projects, direct action is also an incredibly effective tactic because while we can't always stop an entire pipeline from being built by using direct action tactics, we can definitely slow them down. We have pushed the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, Line 3, Line 5, DAPL, Keystone, all these projects ended up being billions of dollars over budget if they were ever completed. Several of them were stopped before they were ever built because it got so expensive. As a direct action movement, we can make those projects more expensive, and we're going to have to. If we lose the ability to sue the bastards in court and win, if we lose the ability to legislate them out of existence, then we're going to have to show up with our bodies and ourselves and stop the things from being built at least for a little while. And if we can buy a year or two years or three years of delay on a lot of these projects, it will be possible for renewable energy to outcompete them because, again, we're putting hundreds of billions of dollars into renewable energy. We're also putting hundreds of billions of dollars into fossil fuels. But if we can screw up the hundreds of billions of dollars of fossil fuel investment with sabotage, with protest, with singing and dancing in the streets, whatever it takes, then that means the hundreds of billions of dollars in renewable energy funding will get there first and will get there faster. Um, and so it's going to be an increasingly important part of the work we do. Uh, another way to say it is uh, they used to say this thing about guns, right? When all guns are outlawed, all gun owners are outlaws. Uh, when all fossil fuel projects are deemed to be the policy of the United States, protesting fossil fuels becomes itself an act of civil disobedience. I talked about this a couple weeks ago when we were talking about why our movement connects with the uh, movement to protect a woman's right to choose and the Roe v. Wade ruling. Now that the Supreme Court has tried to ban abortion, providing abortion services or helping people access abortion services across state lines is direct action. It's a kind of mutual aid where you're helping someone access a thing which would otherwise be illegal, but really it's the law that's immoral, not your action. Classic case, just like lunch counter sit-ins, just like bus ride boycotts, just like all kinds of things that we support and do all the time in the direct action movement, taking these kind of actions is direct action, is mutual aid, and is what we need to be doing over the next couple of months and years. So that's what I'll leave you with. Um, mourn for the dead, fight like hell for the living. 
this is going to be a huge struggle over the next few years. The Mansion Schumer Compromise has a lot of good stuff in it, a lot of bad stuff in it, and a lot of work for us to do as a climate and direct action movement in particular over the coming months. If you want to stay up to date on what we're doing, you may have noticed a lot of the stuff in here comes from Twitter. Uh, we keep a very active Twitter account where we post a lot of analysis and reactions where you can get breaking news about the things that we're doing, including stuff like the baseball game protest uh, just last night at the congressional baseball game. Uh, we did go ahead with that protest. Some groups pulled out when they saw that there was a compromise deal on the table. We did not because we, A, the deal isn't done yet. Uh, and that's what we wanted was a completed uh, climate deal. Uh, B, it's incredibly important, as we've said, to keep the pressure on Congress until they follow through on action. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that we will keep doing. There's actions to plug in with now or never over the next couple of months, plug in with the uh, kick uh, mansion out of his energy chair action. Uh, and there'll be lots more actions on climate emergency, on fossil fuels, and on all these issues that you can plug into over the next couple of months. Um, so thanks for listening for a couple minutes. I know it was a long thread and a long video, but uh, lots in this bill to talk about and dissect. Uh, check the blog post for all the links uh, to source materials and things like that. Thanks for watching. I'm Drew from 198 Methods. Have a great weekend.